Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. This is a place where you can be on the bleeding edge of science. It's being done with the Hubble Space Telescope. My name is Tony Darnell, and I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, with me to facilitate our discussion today is my colleague, Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute, and Scott Lewis from Space Fan News and KnowTheCosmos.com. So these guys are going to uh, help me discuss a very exciting topic today, which is the Frontier Field Survey. We're going to get an update on one of the largest programs ever to use the Hubble Space Telescope. Very ambitious project. We've done Hangouts on this before. And I will make sure that we uh, uh, give you guys a good update as well as uh, a sort of a little bit of background on some of the things we've done if you've not heard of it before. Uh, so before I get started with the introductions, let me say that we are monitoring the Q&A app on, uh, on YouTube and G+, as well as the G+, event, event page from which you, this is being broadcast. And I'm also looking at Twitter with the uh, hashtag Hubble Hangout. So please interact with us, ask us questions, comments. Uh, this is the time to do it because very nowhere else will you get this much up-to-date access to people working directly with the Hubble Space Telescope. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me let me introduce the team members we have here with us today. Starting with Dr. Jennifer Lott, she's the principal investigator of the Frontier Fields Survey, and um, she will be giving us some updates as well as telling us how things are going. Also with us, Dr. Dan Coe, you remember him, he's been in several hangouts with us. He's also an astronomer at Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, and he is going to also uh, give us good insight into what's going on. And for the first time, I have Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Where, where did you go? <laughs> I'm losing it. <laughs> Lou, there it is. Lou uh, Bol Bolger, right? That's your last name? Strolger. Strolger. Sorry. Uh, Lou Strolger. Uh, you didn't have it up, and I drew a blank. Uh, it's also with me for the first time, and I'm, we're going to learn about his role in the project as well as some of his research interests as well. Uh, Dr. Ray Lucas, also a, uh, uh, an astronomer at the Institute working on the team. Dr. Norman Grogan, uh, also with us for the first time. So we got three newbies, and I just saw Anton Kokomer join. Hello, Anton. Welcome. Good to see you again. And uh, so well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we, as I said, we'll be monitoring all those different channels for the questions and comments. But let's start with you, Jen. Why don't you give us a very brief introduction into um, the Frontier Fields Initiative, the, what, what the survey is trying to accomplish. And I also want to mention before you get started that I have put a link in the description box of the event page uh, on Google Plus to our first Hangout. So you can go okay. back and watch a lot of what we've already, back the one we had in October where we over and, and uh, gave a background and overview of the whole survey when it just got started. So, so Jennifer, why don't you give us a brief overview? Okay, sure. Um, I'll try to bring everybody up to speed. So uh, we're now about, uh, I don't know, six months into observing um, this new program called the Frontier Fields. And the aim of this program basically is to peer deeper into the universe than we ever have before. Um, so I think probably many of your listeners have heard of the Hubble Ultra Deep Fields. Uh, a new version of that actually came out uh, quite recently. Last week was made the, made the press. Um, there was an ultraviolet addition to the ultra deep fields. Um, so what the frontier fields is aiming to do is actually to try to peer deeper into the universe than the ultra deep field. And we're going to do that by using uh, a trick from Einstein's theory of general relativity um, by using very massive clusters of galaxies as telescopes. So these objects can bend light and space and act like a telescope and magnify galaxies behind those clusters. And so by peering very deeply at a very massive cluster of galaxy, we should be able to see deeper into the universe than we would otherwise. So the Frontier Fields is aiming to observe six of these strong lensing clusters. Um, we're also getting parallel blank fields near to the cluster. And we are almost done with our first cluster. That's going to happen at the end of this month. So um, we've had a few pretty images out there, but we're really just, um, as I said, getting underway with this long-term project. I have to say, it's one of the most innovative ideas I've heard in a while, using 
gravitational lensing to make the Hubble Space Telescope more powerful than it would otherwise be. It's like adding a pair of, it's like kind of like adding a Barlow lens to the Hubble, right? You can yeah. see just a little <laughs> bit, a little bit further back in, into into uh, this. So you said you're almost done with the first field. I thought we were we were done with uh, with that one. Well, what we're doing is for every uh, cluster, we're going to it back to it twice. Um, so. Hubble has a number of cameras on it, and we're going to we're turning on two cameras at once. One is the infrared camera, the wide field camera three, and the other is our trusty optical camera, the advanced camera for surveys. And while one camera is centered on the cluster, the other camera will be on on a parallel field, holding Hubble at a fixed angle. Um, as we collect a lot of data with those two cameras. And then we have to come back and we have to let Hubble rotate around. Um, and so about six months later we come back to a field switching the cameras. Um, so now we're back to Abel 2744 and we've swapped the cameras. Um, so now we have the advanced camera for surveys, the optical camera on the cluster, the infrared cameras on the parallel field. Um, we got data yesterday, we're going to get data tomorrow, we're getting data all through the end of this month, and then we'll be done with ABEL 2744. So Carol, I wanted to ask you real quick, do you, can you, you've been associated with Hubble forever. Uh, this strikes me as probably the... Wow. <laughs> wow, Tony. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a, from, from a, am I wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> Ever, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you go. So you're one of the. You're one of the. Yeah, uh, Lyman uh, Spitzer and I were like co close friends. No. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Once I, once I introduced uh, Frank's hangout with it's this time of the month, so um, it's, uh, it's so I tend to do that. So anyway, okay. So can you remember? I I I've, I've always described the frontier fields as being one of the most ambitious uh, individual efforts that have been done by the uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. Would you agree with that statement, or is there something been? Has there been anything that's used this much Hubble time? Well, I think. I think what I would comment on is that Hubble has gone through a number of stages and in the early days everybody was scrambling and so the the way the time was allocated was to individual teams. Um, there were some what were called guarantee time observers and they got larger chunks of time but in general we were trying to get everybody in the astronomy community to get a piece of the action and that we had award-winning proposals then. And then with the Hubble Deep Field, it kind of changed things. It changed the game a little bit. There was more cooperation with other observatories, the idea of doing these deep fields and immediately offering all the data to the community to do research on. Right, that's an so important So that's point. one of the things is that the team that you see here is working very hard and they have their own science research goals, but they are, as soon as this data is fully processed and they're confident the data has integrity, it's offered to the entire science community to do research on. So that sea change took place over the last 10 years of doing these. And so we're, I would say that we've been um, trying to do on behalf, it's kind of an observatory uh, on behalf of the community so that everybody in the community can benefit from the observations. But we still have the normal time allocation process going on in parallel. So people are still from individual teams applying for their own data. And then we also have these things called treasury programs, which have a significant amount of data associated with them. But this is sort of interesting because Frontier Fields is on behalf of the community conducted by the observatory. So right. I think that's a little bit. So we have now lots of flavors of kinds of programs done by Hubble Space Telescope. And the fact that this looks so far back in time and gives us this little glimpse of what JWST may see um, after it's launched in 2018 is really exciting. Right, and we're going to get to the the schedule here in just a little bit about where 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 we are in, in the observing program. But it sounds like what you're saying is the nature of the way Hubble is being used now is, is starting to change, and it got it, it started with the uh, whole ter the uh, Hubble Deep Field. And uh, and also we're realistic. We know this telescope won't last forever. What we we pretend like it will, but we know it won't. And so we're really in the phase of thinking about what is it that we have to do 
with HST, you know, before 2020 or 2022 when it may not be operating in an optimal fashion. We've got a beautiful observatory right now. Let's use it to its best advantage. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, Dan, so what, what as, as, uh, Dan Coe, I want to ask you uh, briefly about something that uh, you know Jennifer um, alluded to when she was describing you know how the the, the gravitational lensing what it will do. Um, a lot of that gravitational lensing, when we look at the galaxy clusters that you guys have selected, which I want to talk about too in just a minute, but uh, the when you look at those galaxy clusters, the lensing that's happening there, a lot of it is being affected by the dark matter that is up and around these galaxies, right? And I ask you this because you're my dark matter guy. Whenever okay. I have a dark matter question, I always come to you first. So, uh, so do you want to comment on that a little bit? What, how does, how does dark, what is the role dark matter plays in some of this lensing uh, that you're observing? So dark matter is most of the stuff in the universe. And in these galaxy clusters, there's probably 100 times as much dark matter as there is of the, the stuff that we can see, the, the galaxies themselves, the, the stars that, that burn brightly. Um, so there's, there's, there's so much mass there, and we can measure how much mass is there by this gravitational lensing effect. Um, and so I brought my handy gravitational lens here. Uh, this is a, it's a plastic lens, and I've shown this on these, uh, these hangouts before. You may, you may have seen it before. But uh, basically, it's, it's ground to have a shape that's, that's similar to uh, – this is actually similar to a black hole. So okay, before you start hole. it, though, before you start, Scott, yeah, sure. would, you, would you put up – uh, one of the fields, one of the fields that uh, it doesn't matter which one, uh, one of the frontier fields that they've imaged, because you, well, let's take a look at that, at that, at what the the Hubble is actually taking a picture of, and then we'll go to Dan's demo to kind of give a little bit of of uh, for, of uh, knowledge there. Okay, so so here you see one of the fields on the right is the galaxy cluster um, that is you can see all of these kind of elongated shapes that are kind of in. Uh, the center of this galaxy. Some of the uh, some of these galaxies are actually a little bit distorted. Um, this one's not doesn't have the most uh, biggest examples of what I'm talking about, but uh, you kind of get a sense of some of these galaxies are squished. Some of them are a little bit stretched out, and that's due to the uh, changing uh, or the uh, bending of the light as it goes through the gravitational wells of the. Uh, of the of the galaxy cluster. So with this in mind, uh, Dan, go ahead. Right. So we have light coming from a distant galaxy right. going so, through a cluster. Okay, there you go. I'll let you take it. Yeah. So so this is uh, this is the most distant galaxy we know of yet. <laughs> we believe. <laughs> so this was uh, found in a previous program. It's uh, it's actually gravitationally lends itself, um, and it's still pretty small. But uh, I have it here on my phone and. And when, what happens is when you pass a gravitational lens in front of a distant galaxy, it gets magnified. Here, let me, let me bring up myself a bit bigger. I can, I can see what I'm doing here. So you bring this, this lens in front of it, and it magnifies that distant galaxy, so it makes it bigger. We can see it better. It also makes, makes different arcs that you see in these images, and it even makes multiple images. And we see all of these same effects um, in, these, in these actual Hubble images. Um, and this is how... We, we, we see the, the distant uh, galaxies better, but we can also map out the dark matter that's in this galaxy cluster. So most of the mass that's in this galaxy cluster is stuff that we don't know what it is yet. It's dark matter. We, we can't see it. But by measuring these deflections of the light, we can tell how much mass is there to bend space and time and, and that amount to deflect the light around it and to tell us how powerful that lens is. So so put that back up. Just to, so, so, yeah. so the analogy here is look at the pink and the yellow parts of the light on Dan's phone there that's the that's the light don't worry about the reflections on the wine glass <laughs> right and but that's what's being and the the wine glass bottom is the analogy of a, what I of a galaxy cluster lensing and that's the actual lens now I want to get to the lens models that are being used to figure this out later and we'll go back to this wine glass in just a second but that's what you want to pay attention to and that to me is one of the most easiest ways to see what the heck is going on uh, in, in gravitational lensing. So thank you very much, Dan. Now, you didn't answer my question, though. Uh, how, is dark matter playing the dominant role in yes. this lensing? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. There's, okay. there's 100 times more dark matter than the stuff that we can see. And if it wasn't for the dark matter, the, these magnification effects would be much weaker. Um, and these, these cosmic telescopes would, wouldn't magnify the distant galaxies nearly as much. OK. OK, so that's a brief intro into what Frontier Fields is doing and why they're and and uh, 
and uh, how they're doing it and what the, what they're looking at. Um, we didn't really talk about the parallel fields right now, but maybe we'll get we'll get a chance to do that. But one of the questions that Frontier Fields is trying to answer is: Is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field ubiquitous? I mean, if we look in other areas of the sky. What will we see? Will we see nothing, or will we see more galaxies like we did in the ultra deep field? And if we did, what will they look like? Will they be distributed more or less the same? So these are really important questions that ultimately go into our place in the universe. And so, um, that, that by looking at all at these just six different areas of the sky, uh, they're hoping to help answer that question. Now, um, I want to ask, but I'm not sure to who. Maybe Jennifer. Why did you pick the six clusters you did? Oh, well, that was a very difficult task, actually. <laughs> so this idea was originally conceived by a science working group. Um, and that working group, you know, pulled a bunch of experts and pulled together a list of like 20 or 30 clusters that they thought might be good candidates um, that would be very strong lensers. Um, and then they gave us a long list of criteria, one of which being, you know, you had to to be able to um, you know, have a high prob probability of finding very distant galaxies um, that would be very strongly lensed. Um, the galaxy cluster had to fit within our, ca our camera, right? so it couldn't be too far away, it couldn't be too close. It had to sort of be the, just the right distance to fit within, within the camera. Um, and it also needed to be in a really dark piece of sky. Right. <laughs> so that actually posed kind of a problem By for dark, us. you mean sort of out of the plane of the galaxy, right? Exactly. So we live in a galaxy, um, and if you've ever seen the Milky Way, you're seeing, you know, a lot of stars and actually a lot of dust that's associated with our galaxy. And that makes it really, really hard to see distant, faint galaxies that are not you know, part of our Milky, not part of the Milky Way. Um, and so we wanted to avoid all of that junk that's in our galaxy when we were looking at distant, distant clusters. So we had to throw out a bunch of, of clusters because of that. Um, we also had to throw out clusters that were uh, too close to the plane of our solar system because there's scattered light, zodiacal light, um, that would also um, make it difficult to see really, really faint objects. Um, and then we had some other criteria. We wanted it to, these clusters to be easily followed up by facilities on the ground. Um, so in particular, there's a, a, a telescope, or actually a whole set of telescopes in uh, the deserts of Chile called ALMA, which is a millimeter telescope. And we thought that that telescope would be really um, good and powerful and perhaps be able to follow up any very faint distant galaxies that we found with Hubble. Um, and then of course the other great telescopes on the ground are, are in Hawaii on Mauna Kea um, and we wanted it to be observable from Mauna Kea. So when you add all those you know, selection criteria you actually end up with a very small list of um, good places in the sky and a small list of clusters. Well, I'll say. I mean, it must be hard enough just to find somebody who can the, get the alignment right. I mean, that alone, you know, would seem to be a real, real big filter in terms of what you can observe. But I guess the ground observatory part of it also makes it even more restrictive because you've got to do it where they can see too. Exactly. So. Exactly. Okay. Um, I want to get. I, I'd, uh, I'd jump in and, and just add. This is Norman. Oh I don't, yes. Uh, Hi, Nor Norman. Also helped a lot with this process. By all means, go ahead. That, that even even once we had the most desirable candidates selected, we ran into trouble that this is such a large program that certain targets could not be observed in tandem just because Hubble did not have enough time of the day to point at those targets simultaneously. So even beyond scientific desirability, we had an issue with schedulability, and we had something of a jigsaw puzzle to solve where each season, as it were, we were doing a target and couldn't overlap because we can only do so much at, at one time. Cool. So, um, okay. So I, I want to get to uh, a little bit of where we are now. Uh, so, and then I want to get to some of the some of the science that Ray and uh, Louis Lewer, Lewer are are involved in. But uh, Jennifer, can you give us a quick update? Where are we now? Where's the? I mean, the project started back in uh, October. Yes. Roughly. Yes. We started observing in October. Um, so as I said, we're we're aiming to do six clusters. Uh, we want to do two clusters a year, 
and we have to go and look at each cluster every uh, twice. Uh, so come back after six months. So we started in October with the first observations of Avel 2744. I'm sorry, I'm laughing at Norman here. He's got some really high Norman's tech, uh, high, really high tech stuff going here. Um, <laughs> And then we went and looked at the schedule, yeah. yeah no, I like this, Norman. Can you zoom and enhance all CSI yeah. style? Yeah, zoom in. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Very good. Right. So we went to AML 2744, got some data. Then we switched over to the second cluster, MAX 0416, got some data. Yeah. And now we're back at ABEL 2744. <laughs> and as I said, I think we'll be done by the end of the month with that, our very first, you know, field for which we've collected all the data with both cameras on both the parallel and cluster fields. This isn't quite how I saw that going. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, actually, put, put yours back up. Put yours back oh, up. Oh, oh, you actually have something Scott <laughs> doesn't have. This one has overlap with Spitzer observations. So this uh, that's right. highlights yeah. Yeah. that you're also using the Spitzer Space Telescope to gather observations, too. It, that is exactly. not. Exactly, yeah. That is not on this schedule, which is what Scott is showing, which is from our web page. Yeah. Um, which well, uh, is on the, web page, the, but, the green yeah. is what has well you you explain it to us. Uh, Jim. Well, maybe Norm can explain this. Okay, he's go ahead, Norman. This. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, I, this is a, a bit of that uh, jigsaw puzzle I was describing, which is um, not to, not to block block my face, but we come back twice with every target. So so where you see uh, yeah, when you figure. <laughs> when on the calendar, we're Sorry. observing that target, and all the target names are over here on the side. Okay. Uh, at some point, I'll dredge up the actual electronic version, hopefully by the end of the call. Oh, no, this is way more fun. Ah. <laughs> and so, uh, so you can see there's, there's a blank <laughs> in between the colored bands, where we're, and, and there we're you know, all analyzing data, um, doing Google Hangouts, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, you can see for most of the next, or the current year and the next two years... We plan to be doing these observations, so we're going to be quite busy. Uh, and a as I mentioned earlier, uh, we needed to pick targets that, in some sense, were spring-fall targets paired off with winter-summer targets, so that we don't have much overlap of Hubble trying to do uh, any two different fields at once, because that would just be too many orbits of Hubble to try to get done in that amount of time. So on the far right, or the far left, I should say, are the, is the individual, um, I'll put Scott's up here so you can put your, your yeah, the rest. Uh, so the, uh, on the far, far left is the galaxy cluster, and, yep. uh, and then throughout are the dates for when everything is going to get observed. That's right. And right now, Abel 2744 has been, you're starting your second pass on that one? That's, That's right. That's right. And... Uh, what's the other one? Max O four sixteen. Is that how I say that? J O four sixteen. Is that how you guys mm -hmm. pronounce it? Mm -hmm. That one is complete. Is that right? Is that what your blog said? Uh, the first no, time. no. We're coming back to it in August. Oh, you're coming back. To, oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the blog, the blog post that I read said that you were finished with the first, the first part of it. The first that's right. Part. Advanced camera for surveys for the main field and the wide field camera for the the parallel field. And and looking at the schedule, okay. Remember that all the other observations have to, that Hubble is doing has to fit in a schedule like this. So imagine every one of the observations that is being done by all the community folded into a calendar like this, and that's what scheduling is like. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, clearly they didn't us all the Hubble time, which you know would have been lovely, but uh, <laughs> right. well, clearly great. Frontier Fields gets the highest priority, obviously. Oh uh, well, <laughs> not always. <laughs> we, we've tried to make our program friendly to other observing that's going on. That's that's why these bands of color here are as wide as they are. Yeah. We we try to <laughs> allow for other people to get their work done without impinging on the schedule too severely. We've had a few interesting schedule issues, so. <laughs> Anything you care to share, or just uh, just work? They just worked out okay. Um, well, I could I could explain one issue that we came up with that actually the the people Ray and and Anton actually helped us solve quite quickly. So um, during our last observing epic, which was uh, Max 0416, uh, we had infrared observations of the parallel field. <clears throat> and there's a unique characteristic for infrared cameras in that sometimes if you go and observe something extremely bright 
it takes a while. Um, it can leave kind of a light, an echo in the camera, something that we call persistence. Um, and we ended up catching persistence in um, one of our, a, a set of our observations uh, for the frontier fields. And it turns out actually that was coming from a planet, or from an exoplanet observation that happened about 10 hours before before our observations. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So, so you're gonna have to explain this to me. Uh, persistence means you were getting o observations from a previous. You were still getting. That's right. So the signal camera, from a previous Hubble observation. Yeah. So that 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 was looking at an incredibly bright star, and spreading the light out of that star over most of the infrared camera, and they were looking for very faint um, variations in the brightness of that star due to a planet going around that star. Getting a light curve, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. so they were kind of doing the exact opposite of what we're doing, right? We're looking for very tiny little faint dots, and they're looking at really, really bright stars. Yeah, you're going to annoy Hubble, you keep doing this, right? Right, so they were getting their observations shortly before ours, and there was a signal left over in the, in the camera. Okay. Um, but because we have a crack team, our team is looking at the data as soon as it comes off the camera, like like you know, within within hours. So Ray and, and Anton are, are, are working on that. And Ray is one of the people that does our data quality inspections um, and caught it quite quickly. And, um, you know, this is a problem for us, but it's not just a problem for us. It's a problem for other Hubble users oh, who, who have observations after these. And so because of that, we were able to, to change the schedule and change the way that those observations are, are, are now planned. Oh, good. Well, I want to get to some of the surprises you guys have run across uh, in, so far, but before we do, uh, so Ray, you want to comment on that? What was that like? The, uh, uh, you know, this. It, while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and explain to us what you're what you're doing on the project as well? One of the roles that you have. <laughs> well, in deference to Carol and uh, other folks, I'm I may be the oldest on here. I'm not. Well, you've sure. been forever. Oh. I'm not going to ask anyone. Yay! To do, but, uh, <laughs> Let's compare. <laughs> Who's the oldest? I, time? <laughs> Ray has been here longer I, than me. <laughs> I, I actually got into this deep fields business. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Carol. <laughs> I actually got into this deep fields business way back in the early 90s when I was working with Alan Dressler's um, programs to observe medium distance galaxy clusters. These weren't particularly known for having lensing and arcs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, as any prominent part of them, but um, I worked on that with him as uh, his institute contact here in a number of ways, and then uh, leading that helped inspire uh, the original Hubble Deep Field, and so I was asked to help with some of that. Uh, started out in a very informal way; we were all just sort of deciding or talking about. What could we do? And you know, various other things happened. It grew into the project that we all know it turned into. But um, I was part of that. And then but, the but uh, later Hubble Deep Field South. Back then, it and, wasn't at all certain that you were going to get those, uh, get any real data no, back then, wasn't it? But wasn't that kind of a risky observation? No. Uh, it was viewed that way by people a lot back then. Uh, th there were um, you get a lot of guff. But, there were a number of people, actually, who, uh, you know, for better or worse, from their own perspective, <coughs> at the time were asked if they might be interested in helping do, it, do this or that. And, you know, there were a number of people who, for their own reasons, and, you know, they had their own priorities, but they, you know, felt, you know, I really might sink a lot of my time into this when I've got other things that I need to do with my career that I know are more certain and, you know, <laughs> they didn't do it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I, I don't think those people should be... i got things I need to do with my career right now. That well, is. but I don't think those people should be faulted for it, really, because, you know, they, no one ever knows for sure how things will turn out. And, you know, they had definite things that they wanted to work on that they could clearly see they had plenty to do with. So uh, I, I think it's sort of a combination of, uh, okay, I can, I can see some time or interest enough in myself to want to try this and enough of a sense of, you know, being part of something that's risky but could turn out to be historic. And, you know, you, you just do it. And that's a decision that everyone has to make for themselves. Um, as I said, I got involved in it because 
uh, I was being asked, you know, can we do this kind of thing even? Is it feasible with the telescope? And uh, I, that role sort of propagated into several other programs that we worked on. Uh, as I said, after the original Hubble Deep Field, I worked on the Hubble Deep Field South and then the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And, um, and for some uh, very large uh, geo programs, guest observer or general observer programs that go through the peer review, unlike these uh, programs do. Um, I, you know, I was in the role of one called Goods uh, at first of trying to figure out if we could do it at all, and then thankfully Norman came along and ever since has been taking over that kind of stuff in great detail, and I'm very grateful for Norman, <laughs> but, because he's very good at it, and it's very hard work, so nice. it, it involves a lot of iteration back and forth, finding all kinds of problems, as he mentioned, uh, uh, you know, things like target visibility times, uh, guide star, lack of guide stars, all of these operational issues like that that have to be factored in to actually make the observations. And as far as my own uh, part in this, I mean, I originally got uh, involved in this uh, at the early level or early time, sort of talking about things like general advice, historical precedents, things that we had done with the original Hubble Deep Field and the other early observations, um, you know, more as uh, more as just sort of, oh yes, I remember we did this back then, this was a good idea, or that, you know, maybe that didn't turn out so well, or that kind of thing. Um, so I was just a little bit of institutional memory in that sense, um, talking about program designs, development, testing, uh, policies. Uh, believe it or not, there are policies for us involved with this here. If you actually have your fingers in the data, you know, in the pixels in any way, you, you can't really uh, uh, be immediately engaged in science uh, right away. That's because of, you know, you don't want to uh, have the situation where people in the institute have an earlier advantage over there. Uh, but that's not true either. Outside. That's not right. I mean, in this case, we've got the uh, uh, Frontier uh, Fields data are, are available to everybody all the time, right? Frontier, so, Frontier, Frontier Fields data, data are available to everyone, everyone but we do, we do make enhanced that are better. Your audio, audio is sounding what we're doing. Am I the only one hearing that? No, the, uh, Ray, your audio is breaking. You know, Okay. Yeah. Mm. I, don't I don't know what's happening. I haven't done anything. All right. Well, let's let's see. Let's hope it works itself out a little bit. So let me yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go. Let's go a little bit to the. Uh, let's go a little bit to the to where we are now. The fields that we have now. We have two fields so far that we've imaged. Um, uh, Lou, I'd like to get you in on this discussion. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing on the project? But uh, what can you tell us about where we're at now on with with the Frontier Fields observations? So uh, I think Jen gave a little bit of a progress report on the the, field, the frontier fields progress. Uh, I'm a part of a sort of a a piggyback or a satellite project to look for supernovae in these fields and try to analyze them to tell us something about you know uh, the environments of uh, of of uh, the early universe. Um, our project has as Looked at each one of each frame of the frontier fields as they come in, and difference those frames to look for these, you know, uh, very. I mean, you subtracted one from the other, and what's left behind is stuff that's different, something that's, that's right. changing. Okay. Anything, anything that goes bump in the night, anything that changes in brightness, <laughs> we pick up. And our plan is to to analyze each one, look for potential supernovae, identify those supernovae, and see if we can't learn something about the early universe you from found them. Any yet? Yes, we've been very successful. We've found 13 so far. 13 supernovae. Yeah, wow. yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a little bit larger than we expected, but uh, that's a, it's a. How good, many weeks were you expecting? Uh, I don't remember. It, it, these things are actually pretty broad. If you think of. You like you'd be the, happy if you caught two or three, right? I mean, yeah. Well, it's not that <laughs> bad, but it's it's something like on the order of a handful, and now we're you know we're doing, uh, quite quite well. Um, and it depends also on what type of supernova you're looking for, whether or not it's 
related to very massive stars or uh, the more coveted, you know, type 1a supernovae, which we use to determine the distances to uh, uh, galaxies precisely and measure dark energy from. So this project is a little different from our usual dark energy mission, where we're looking more to understand the supernovae in the environments themselves. So we've been trying Wait, we have, to... We have a dark energy mission? <laughs> no. Uh, so with these deep fields that have been going on for 15 plus years, uh, well, at least since goods, so let's say 10 years, we've had a component, or we've built in a component to those... Uh, um, to the, the way in which those fields were accumulated to allow us to search for distant supernovae within them. The mission then was to try and uh, find as many type 1a supernovae as we could and determine if the universe was indeed not only accelerating at relatively recent epochs in the past, but also decelerating at even further uh, epics or even uh, Still earlier looking epics. for that deceleration, aren't you guys? You're blowing no, me I th we found it. We were very happy we found it. It's <laughs> I know, I know. You guys were so sure the deceleration was going to happen. They're, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got a big fat medallion for, for, for that, and uh, I didn't wear it today, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, it, we were very happy we found it. And so since then, the mission has been changing, evolving, uh, to uh, further ref refining the, the measure of dark energy, uh, which we still do to this day, but also taking on other projects. Uh, we're, the great thing about these fields is the lensing, and the lensing allows us to probe even earlier in the universe than we have before. And we can do some really interesting things like that, like say what the rate of occurrence of events are like in the very early universe. Uh, we could say, um, you know, if we can see some of the most, the earliest supernovae from the, you know, prim primordial super stars, excuse me, the first stars. If we could see supernovae from the first stars, that might be very important and very interesting. Okay. So the lensing the lensings allows us to see this through the magnification that we get. But Lou, aren't the, yeah. the supernova, especially the type 1As, also really useful for testing how well we understand the lensing in the yeah. clusters. Because you know what the distance is, you know how bright that supernova is supposed to be, and so you can see if your prediction of the magnification due to the cluster is right or not. That's right. So we can actually turn the, the, the test around, and we can use the, precise, the precision of the supernova to tell us something about the accuracy of the magnification maps. Uh, and in fact, we have a really new candidate, which we just found uh, in the last few weeks, that is indeed a very precise type 1a supernova. It's uh, in a rather unique uh, environment, but it's more or less uh, unobscured, doesn't have extinction to it. And it's a very ideal object for measuring distances and measuring precise luminosities. And we can use that to test the lens model at that what location. What cluster was that in? This is in a a Abel 2744. Okay. So I just need to, let me see if I can rephrase this in a way that might be a little more uh, understandable to some people because I want to make sure this is an important point you're making. So type 1A supernovae are a, are a supernova that we, they're a very special kind, we, and they, we know they're special because we know their intrinsic brightness. We know how bright they really are as if they would be right next to us. We don't want them to be right next to us, but if they were, knowing how bright something is intrinsically and then measuring its brightness from wherever it is, we get some sense of how far away it is. That's why they're such good yardsticks. But what Lou is saying is they also can use those to tell them something about the way in which the lens that that light is traveling through is being modeled and how well they're doing at it. Am I right? So, so if on. you are doing a good job with your model, then you would see a brightness that you observe with the frontier field. If you're doing a bad job with your model, then frontier fields is going to show you something different uh, because you're wrong. Your model isn't acting right on the on the and and now that we're on the subject of models, we should probably bring that up now. Models are these things that you invent mathematically that explain what is happening to the light as it travels through the galaxy cluster. In other words, you get these squished out galaxies that are all 
weird and snaky looking and, and weird uh, shapes. It's being done to by by the, the actual gravitational lens. You're trying to mathematically describe that. And you've got some, right? Who wants to talk about the models? Dan? Yeah. yeah Anton? Sure. Okay, Dan, you want to talk about the models? Yeah, we Anton, I mean, I'm gonna get you in on this in just a minute. Don't worry. I know I gotta get you in on because I will I will talk about data. <laughs> There's all this dark matter in the cluster, like we talked about, but we don't know exactly where it is. And and just like you said, Tony, we we observe this lensing, and and based on that lensing, we we can map it out in some detail, but but not perfectly. Um, and so we actually had five different teams from the community all submit their models, um, so that everybody could could use them. So they, these are all public. So they all uh, had their are, favorite models, and they all said, "Use mine, use mine." And right. They all mine. they all have different ways of, of of modeling and describing exactly how the dark matter is distributed, and you know, there's it's constrained to some degree by the lensing, but not exactly. Um, and so they all submitted these models, and and these are teams that had you know kind of had friendly competition before, and they they each you know proposed their models, and they tried to one up each other, and you know, um, and in this case, they all worked together. Um, so we brought them all together. They did. Um, you know, they shared all the best available lensing data that they had, um, and they, you know, they then they went off and they worked separately and they made these models. They, you know, but they kind of cooperated, and and so now this is all available. And so for any galaxy that you see being lensed by one of these uh, frontier fields clusters or any supernova, um, you can you can go to to a web page. And you can you can figure out what are the different magnification estimates from all these different models. How much do the models say that this galaxy is being magnified? Um, and it'll give you this this whole range of predictions um, that then you can, in the case of a supernova, you can then predict, uh, you can then compare against what you actually know the magnification is. And so here's here's one going. now. Scott's got one up. He went to the mast and pulled this up. Yeah, that's so, one of the right. So so what we're looking at here is actually. Um, so the the magnification of a distant galaxy also depends on how far away that galaxy is. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at magnifications for three different distances, um, and that's that's what you're seeing in the different colors. So it's a little bit confusing, um, but basically. So wait, so this is this is the mathematical model. Right, colors, right. So this is this the is colors are model. different magnifications. Blue is maybe a different magnification than red. Right. Well, so blue is for a galaxy that's a certain distance away, and then green is for a galaxy that's more distant, and then red is for the, some of the most distant galaxies we've we've yet discovered. Red is is for those galaxies. So if that's what you're interested in most, like me, you would be looking at the at the red in this image here. And so what you're looking at here, th those where it's it's bright red is where the magnification is highest. Um, so how are these how are these models doing? How how uh, good are they? They're, I, I'd say they're doing well. So, um, Any surprises? I, so I, I would say they're not. But <laughs> <laughs> why would you say that? Why would you say that, Lou? Uh, so our our first supernova that we had a chance to do this with is uh, the, the what I mentioned last week. So we're still looking at the data, but the preliminary results are kind of interesting. We we think the lens models predict something like a uh, factor of ten. Magnification, so the object should be ten times brighter uh, than you would expect for its for its distance or its uh, epoch. Uh, what we observe is something more like a, just a thirty percent increase in brightness. So maybe this is a hole in the lens model, or maybe it's saying that there's a problem with the lens model. Yeah, that is interesting. And I mean, because didn't you all just have a press release saying that this worked really well for supernovae? Yeah, yeah well, we're... sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. Oh, so Default so about... bleeding edge of God. You have to be a little more skeptical about the press material. Right. <laughs> right last, last time it. Sorry, last time it seemed to work well, and uh, you know there are there are a range of predictions. So I, I mean, did they all? Well, anyway, we'll you know we'll have time to you know maybe yeah. discuss that offline. So, so we've got we've got some uh, we've got a lot of comments and stuff. But Anton, let me get you in on this discussion. Welcome, by the way. It's good to see you again. I haven't seen you since Double AS. Thank you, Tony. Well, we've been kind of busy. Uh, uh, I guess so. Tell us data coming in, and so we've been doing all this new uh, combination of data. Sure. Um, thank you for having me on. So you're doing the uh, you're doing the pipeline and calibrations and things like that. Has there been any any uh, any surprises? Any things that that you uh, have come across that you didn't expect? Yeah, sure. So let me answer. So you've asked a few times what's the status of our current observing. I can give a quick yes. update on that. Uh, maybe add a few more details to what Jan was saying earlier. That'd be so wonderful. yeah, so we've now basically finished uh, 
almost finished our first cluster. Uh, we're about, uh, let's say, two thirds or three quarters of the way through our second epoch. We have these two epochs on the clusters. And when we're done, that means we have complete coverage in both cameras on the cluster and also on this parallel field. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're basically looking at the data as it comes in. So I've got this team of folks helping me. I've got Ray. I've got about a half dozen other people, um, all looking at images as they come in. And I can actually share with you what we do is basically we look live almost at the exposure, sort of after within a couple of hours after Hubble takes it, uh, the images come down and we can look at them and we can inspect them very quickly and have a really quick turnaround. So I can in fact share with you all if I can figure out how to do the screen sharing here. All right. Yeah, um, it's, some it's, of the latest data that came in last night. Let me see if this will work. It's a green arrow, that arrow yeah. in the green screen there. You see that? Sure. Uh, um, yeah, it comes up, and then there's a button that says Start Screen Share, but it's grey for me. I can't click that, so I don't know why it doesn't want me to do that. Oh, sorry. Um, to hear that. Oh, it's okay. You need to click the window when that pops up. It'll give you okay. an option of which to choose. Oh, cute. Okay, let me do that. Yep, I see that. So I'm going to screen share this window, and this is the most recent observations that came in. Nice. Uh, oh wow! Bring that up. So that came in overnight, uh, kind of yesterday evening, uh, and Hubble just took that basically not even a day ago, kind of within 12 hours ago maybe. And wow. this is the images pretty much as we see them coming in from the telescope. Uh, we put these them are some basic. Filters? Are they all the same filter? They're all the same filter, uh, so these are different exposures. Uh, so each each orbit, basically, we take four exposures in the given filter. And the difference between the ones on the left and the ones on the right, in this case, uh, we apply a special uh, background sky subtraction. These are really quality checks. Um, ideally, they should look the same, and luckily they do. Uh, if they look different in any way, then this means there's something wrong with the exposure. Well, what about, what about Lou and his uh, subtractions? What would you be subtracting, Lou? You'd be... Doing another another orbit later or what? That's correct. So we would be looking at let's say the very first visit relative to this this visit. Okay. Yeah, and so what Lou would be doing uh, would be when you subtract these images, you'd see very little difference. There'd be maybe a few specks that are different, and some of them would be bad pixels or. Uh, things that change in the detector, and just a very small fraction of those would actually be the supernovae. Um, but this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, we can sort of look at when we do these checks. Um, how okay. do we turn off the screen share? I just want to. You're off. You did. Yeah, cool. Yeah, 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 we're back to we're back to we're yeah, you're, okay. You're, no. So, um, so if I can just interject a comment, I think Antenna is kind of underselling mm -hmm. calibration. Yeah, I think so too. Calibration <laughs> is, and I've watched Anton as you know, outreach observer, with the rest of the team pouring over these observations and picking over every little nuance. And so, calibration pipeline. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what a calibration pipeline is, because it's not like taking a cell phone picture and putting it on Facebook. Yeah, let's say a few words about it. Um, yeah. so these pictures you see, they've actually been through calibration already, so they look a little bit prettier than, than the actual raw images we get from the telescope. Which look real um, nasty, by the way, folks. They do not yeah. look, you know, they look, they got all kinds of stuff in them. They look pretty ugly um, because the detectors are not perfect, and so you get all kinds of junk on them. In fact, you can see it yourself. If you take a picture, uh, s some cell phones will do this and some cameras too. Take like a long exposure at night if you're taking a picture of somebody in the evening. Yeah, that's a good analogy. It'll, it'll, take, it'll take maybe a few seconds for the shutter to open and close. And when you look at their picture, you'll see their little bright spots all over the image. And we deal with much the same thing. We deal with these little random bright spots that are in different exposures. And so that's one aspect of the calibration, is making sure that the things in the detector are actually removed before we can make a clean image. So yes, yeah, so we spend our time checking these images and also running all the software pipelines to clean them up. And so what you see in the end when we make these pretty color pictures um, it's basically a, a version of that for each different filter, each different color. Uh, you have to first clean them up and stack them and make them deeper. And once you've done that, that takes a, a few weeks to do. Then we can serve them out and let the rest of the community use them. Um, but yeah, that's what keeps us busy at night is to, I'm just, to get I'm these just images glad out. To remove all the UFOs and stuff, so I don't. Have to <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking no, of no, UFOs, so so, so Hubble is in space, right? And so there are other satellites in space, and occasionally these go across the field of Hubble. 
And so we see these bright streaks on the images sometimes. And folks like Ray do a heroic job of identifying these images and actually masking them out. Because otherwise, the whole image would be crisscrossed by other satellites. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to see the faint game. Know, it's, like, what are the, it's really crowded up there now. It's not like the old days. Everybody's up there now. That's I, right, yeah. I worry about that real estate and the L2 point is going to get crowded too, it looks like, <laughs> at some point as well. So, uh, Ray, I, I guess I think you're back now. I wanted to get you yeah. just get a few more thoughts. I I want to get uh, to a lot of comments and stuff that we have too, but you didn't get a chance to finish your thought, and I just wanted to know if you had anything else you would like to add. Uh, well, you were talking about, uh, maybe in several different areas, uh, you were talking about models, and I, I think one of the most fascinating things uh, to me and it's something that people try to model, but it depends on the accuracy of, of what is known there and how, how good a quality it is. Uh, people will sometimes try to look at distant galaxies that are lensed by the foreground clusters, and they'll try to essentially deproject those um, galaxies as observed into what they really have in the way of shape. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating process. I wonder they do always, that, by the way. I guess that, that obviously depends on how good your model is. But, I mean, yes, look, and there's always a lot of room for skepticism, I imagine. But Yeah, Lou, Lou, Lou's not going to be impressed, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think it's one of the most fascinating things about this. I've always been interested in galaxy know, morphologies in a lot of the uh, survey projects that I've been part of. And uh, and so I think this is this is a really fascinating aspect of it. Not only the... Uh, bringing into visibility of the most distant objects, but also uh, trying to see where possible, you know, the, the structure of some more distant galaxies. Of course, the, the main point here, I think, is, is really finding those sort of, uh, you know, earliest galaxies, if we can. But, but this is just sort of a, uh, an interesting, not quite diversion, but it's, it's a separate topic. But I so think we, it's very fascinating. I don't know Jennifer. if Scott can bring up the image that I sent him earlier. There's a really good example of an object that's that's not the most distant thing in the universe, but is extremely highly magnified by our cluster Max 0416. Um, and actually, there's just beautiful things all over that image. But oh, okay, we have it up now. Yeah, if you zoom in towards the center, let me. See, let me um, even more. Yeah, it's right. It's that kind of blue fuzzy thing. Yeah, look at all of them. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, the, the reddish orangish galaxies are the cluster galaxies. Those are the things that are doing are the, the lensing. Yeah. And then the things that are those blue arky things are the background galaxies, which are not, you know, those are probably not the most distant things, but, but they're really, you know, highly magnified. And then if you look, you know, close to that bright central galaxy, there's something that's kind of fuzzy and blue and red. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a galaxy that's magnified by like a factor of 20. Um, so we're just seeing that object. Just up Jupiter. Yeah, yeah it's um, not. It's a, it's a galaxy that's just been magnified much, much, much more than you could you know, it's at a much higher spatial resolution than anything that Hubble would normally see. Um, wow, that's, that's, this is a beautiful image. This is, yeah. this is a great example of what uh, Dan <laughs> was trying to show also with the uh, wine glass demonstration. So. Yeah. yeah and, and again, also, there's the distortion aspect. Even though something's highly magnified, it may be distorted quite a bit. And that's part of what I was talking about by deprojection of, you know, trying to apply the distortion correction, if you will, for the gravitational distortion correction. Mm -hmm. there, there are also other distortion corrections in the images but that, that we have to do, but that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. So what's that bright eye of Sauron thing there, not to... <laughs> <laughs> Which one? The red, and blue, the red and blue points are stars. The little ring of green dots. Yeah, look at that. that that's a multiply imaged thing that's it's being imaged not only by the cluster but by that red those smaller red galaxies there. Wow. Um, you can scroll all over this image and see examples like that. Um, actually, if you go the other way towards the bottom, there's some cool things of... Is this uh, available for people, or is this something that... Uh, um, 
it's not, but we can make it a bit. We should put it on our blog. Yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, right in the corner there. I don't know if you see. There's a there's a galaxy that's lensed, and it's being warped by that edge on red galaxy there. I mean, it's it's just you know I I can look wow, at this. Wow, this has got there. a lot. Look at all of them. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, of them. yeah. So. You got to use. Do you have to use different models for different galaxies, or how do you? How do you? Or do, is it? Are the models working only for certain clusters? I mean, how do you apply the models? Maybe so, that's a really hard question. Yeah, but. I don't know if Dan can answer I, that one. Well, the the one thing I wanted to point out. I mean, each one of these lensed galaxies that you see there is another piece to the puzzle. <laughs> it's another yeah. piece to the puzzle of where the dark matter is, and we see so many more of these in these really deep images than we did before. Um, so the, the the models of the magnifications are just getting better and better. Did you say what cluster this was? This is Max O416. Right. And this is Max O416. This is our very deep optical image of this. So actually, any very distant galaxies are not even visible because they're only apparent in the infrared. That's right. They'd show up in the infrared. Okay. And we'll be getting the infrared data in sort of August. Okay, great. Well, guys, uh, we're gonna we're we're gonna keep having more Frontier Fields uh, hangouts, but I really want to get to some some questions, but before too much time passes, and and going along with the uh, the different galaxies at different distances kind of thing, I have something here from Adam Synergy who says, I think the deepest images so far have revealed galaxies at around Z equals seven point eight. So how deep can HST go now? Briefly say as, in as few words as possible what Z means, <laughs> and then uh, maybe I don't know who's that to uh, Dan. You know, that's Dan. Sure. So, so Z is called is redshift. Uh, we we talk about it as the letter, and it's just a number. It's it's a number, and it, what it describes is how much the universe has stretched over the 13 billion year history of our universe. Um, so if it's if it's a Z of of one, it means the universe was half its size back then. Um, if it's a Z of 2, it means the universe was a third of its size back when we see it, and it's been stretched by that factor. And as the universe is stretched, it stretched the light along with it into redder and redder wavelengths. Um, and if it's far enough away, you see the galaxy all the way in the infrared. And that's why we need to look in the infrared to see the most distant galaxies. Um, so the question was that we, we see galaxies out to redshift of, of 7.8. Um, I think so th there's, there's confirmed galaxies or you obtain a spectrum, and so you, you can tell that the galaxy is definitely out to redshift 7.5 or 7.6. Um, those have been confirmed. Um, but then further out, you have what are candidates um, all the way out to redshift 11, um, and that was the one that I was that I was showing on my on my phone earlier. Yeah, that's right, Dan. We had a hangout about that a while back. Too. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so Craig Landon is saying, poor Dr. Lotz, relegated <laughs> to the STSCI dungeon venue. <laughs> I believe how long does one have to work there to be allowed above ground? Are you in a dungeon? Where are you? Yeah, look, look. <laughs> no, see, that's not a dungeon. I'm not going to put no, it. They gave you artificial floor. panels to make it I, look like you're outside? Yeah. It's <laughs> so advanced I out there. I this office, so it's very um, sparse. <laughs> I like you. What that office about? has windows, doesn't it? <laughs> They're on the other side. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so here's one from Nav Ver Vermeer who goes, is it possible that the first AGN's black, black holes hole. also suck in dark matter? Well, that's a good question. And were the seeds for the supermassive black holes we observe today? Question mark. That's a good one for Anton or Norman. Yeah, I can okay. take a crack at that. Um, okay. So it turns out black holes actually are dark matter in a, in a way. Um, one candidate for dark matter at one point was lots of small mini or micro black holes because uh, they're dark, uh, you don't see them, and they can basically just act as gravitational lenses. I think that's now been largely ruled out. Black holes are obviously not a, a, a candidate for the dark matter we see around galaxies. Um, it's more likely to be very small particles. But the black holes certainly can still suck in anything that, uh, that that feels gravity and that has mass. Um, I think the main thing about the black holes is even if they were to suck in dark matter, uh, we wouldn't actually see it. Dark matter tends not to interact with other, with normal matter. And so the way we see black holes is when they suck in normal gas like uh, hydrogen and helium and so forth. Uh, that gas heats up 
and it heats up a lot actually. It heats up to about a million degrees as it's being sucked in by the black hole. And so when this gas heats up, it gives off a lot of high energy radiation. It gives off things like X-rays and ultraviolet and so forth. Just before it ever gets into the black hole, it forms a sort of a disk around the black hole and gives off all those X-rays. And that's what we see. That's actually why we can see black holes at all. We don't actually see the black holes. What we see is the gas that's around them that's lighting up and giving off all those X-rays. And it's an interesting question. Uh, these frontier fields clusters are not actually, um, I would say, the best place to see early black holes because they tend to be so rare. Um, and the frontier fields is like a very narrow pencil beam looking back into the early universe. Um, narrower even than the ultra deep field and the other big surveys. So if there are early black holes, if we're very lucky we might see them with the frontier fields. But our better chance is to look at some of the other big surveys that we've been doing like the Cosmos survey and goods and our candles um, because th they spread out more and so we tend to uh, we tend to need a big survey to find even just a few. Early black Anton, holes. can I just can I just stop you? For a brief interruption here. Jennifer, Jen, Jen has to go. Uh, she's got other commitments. I just wanted to break in real fast and say, Jennifer, so thank you <laughs> for for being here. And uh, you're laughing because <laughs> she has to. She has lots of other things to do. Um, so anyway, thank you for attending. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Really Thanks. This was fun. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and and we're back. We're going to be back for more updates on this. Okay. Right? Okay. You'll join right. us again. Great. Yep. Sounds okay. good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Bye bye. Okay, Anton. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, for I'm, that. I'm done. I have to go too. So. Oh, you have to go talk. <laughs> oh, I wanted to talk to you. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess. Or I'm spinning out. Huh? Yeah, I guess so. I guess we are at the end of our time, and we should uh, we should just probably cut it here. I'm afraid. Although um, I do have one question that I really wanted answered. Uh, okay. From YouTube, and I cannot pronounce his name, so I'm just going to share this up on the window here. Here we go. Um, is if purpose of the frontier fields is to check whether the galaxies are distributed in the, in the ultra deep field around the sky, isn't it better to just do another ultra deep field at different locations instead of uh, deep fields around the clusters? Or having it close to these uh, gravitational lens areas is that going to affect the the deep fields that we get out of it to compare to the original? Anybody? We're doing both, so we're doing more of the deep fields, and we're also doing the lensing alongside of it. So we're we're observing yeah. even deeper. That's with right. The lensing. We didn't talk much about the parallel fields yeah. that we're doing as well with these, but that's another yeah. It, it is a two for yeah. one. Yeah. 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 yeah a good Fairly quick answer. Away. There's a quick answer to it. That the parallel fields are far enough away from the main cluster yes. that basically they are like another ultra deep field. Um, there's a bit of weak lensing still from the cluster, but not very much. And so each parallel field is basically like an ultra deep field. So, yes, so we're basically getting six more ultra deep fields. They're not quite as deep as the original, but they're within half a magnitude. Right. And in addition, we're getting these clusters. So we're getting a two for one, basically. It yeah, sounds really good. Really in astronomer way. parlance, what he's talking about is cosmic variance, and you know it, that's exactly what we're doing by getting all these different parallel fields around different places in the sky. You yeah, you see how they're how normal each one is compared to the rest. That's right. You can only view your elephant through a straw. You kind of want to try to take as many yeah. sight lines as possible to make. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we get six straws. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what they're talking about is imagine in the, uh, the 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 field of view of the Hubble are two cameras, uh, each looking at the same. They're each looking at slightly different areas of the image plane, and they're able to image at the exact same time, uh, not only the cluster but the area just adjacent to it in another camera. And then as Jen was saying at the beginning, they come back to it and they rotate and they use different cameras each time uh, to look at those things. So that's what that's to complete the, the wavelength coverage. Yeah, and yeah. it's using it's using uh, the Hubble, uh, I think, in a pretty efficient way. So, guys, also as always, it's great to talk frontier fields, ultra deep fields, far away things, dark matter. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us an update. You guys are doing great work. Um, we're gonna look to get another. Uh, oh, well, uh, can somebody comment just real fast, Anton? I know you got to go, so feel free if you've got to go. Just you know, go ahead. I just want to take a couple more minutes and ask. Uh, you know, is there? This was scheduled for three years. This survey. Is it look like you're going to take that third year or not? It's a good question. We've got a decision point later this year, actually, uh, about November or so, 
as to whether or not to do the final two clusters. We're certainly committed to doing the first four. And why wouldn't later on this year? Yeah, why wouldn't we? Um, if Hubble keeps going, if the community supports it, if it's interesting science that's coming out, then sure, it it's actually it provides a good motivation to do the last two. I think basically we want to to have to see people like Lou find supernovae, or to see people like Dan find hydrogen galaxies. <laughs> like they keep doing that good stuff, uh, then that provides a good incentive for us to do the final two clusters. And same for the rest of the community too. We're throwing this wide open for the whole community to to go and find. Uh, things. But actually, uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned, we've got about almost well, well over a dozen, almost approaching 20 different scientific papers from different teams in the community already that have been submitted yes. that are using the frontier fields to do different kinds of discoveries. So we're throwing it out there. Yeah, Carolyn, and I want to talk about that. The community is actually using, using these data. So yeah. I think if the community keeps using it and keeps finding interesting science, that would be a very strong case for us to do the final two clusters. <laughs> yeah, so well, it's nice that you're being so polite. I mean, if you still got the community support and everybody is, you're still getting good results, and everybody's, you know, uh, still thinks you should still be doing it, then you will. I think that's. Well, uh, it's not just being polite. I mean, we really have to, uh, you know, undergo the assessment of the community. You have to prove sense. that what you're doing uh, is worth the time. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. I mean. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, and I, I want to comment that we've been talking about the time allocation uh, process, which is going on right now, and each proposal has maybe ten people that look at it. That's right. Your fields team has the entire community looking at them, right? So it's not just <laughs> 10 opinions. And let me tell you, astronomers by no means, if you have 10 astronomers in a room, you have 100 ideas. So if you have you know, thousands of astronomers all looking at the project, they have but you guys are thousands, safe because... hundreds of thousands of opinions of whether this is worthwhile. And so you try to get the consensus view. Yeah. You know, and astronomers never because, have strong opinions. Right, strong yeah, astronomers never have. have. But it's a good thing because it means that the community is behind the, the project, which means that they understand understand they have a vested interest in it. So there's a, there's a good flip side to that. Right. Well, one thing that I would add is that, um, at, at least at the onset of the project, we were hoping that uh, citizen science might be an aspect of this. And we haven't really been exploiting that too much. But when we say community, we're thinking of not just astronomers, but maybe right. even of the, of the public as well helping out with the effort. We will, that's though. That's in, that's in progress as you, as you complete the observations on the first two. Yeah, he brings up a good point. All of these data are available on the archive. You can just log in and get them yourselves. And and uh, Carol and I will be talking a lot more about uh, the time allocation process of Hubble and not next week's Hangout, but the one after. And the, uh, or no, maybe it's two Hangouts from now. And then there's the... Uh, uh, the issue of uh, other collaborators for Frontier Fields. Carol right. and I want to organize another hangout to discuss with them some of the ways in which they're using Frontier Fields data. So that's all coming uh, down the pipeline. So stay tuned. Guys, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Lou and thank Ray, you. it was great to have you. Thank you, Norman. Uh, Anton, as always, it's great to have you. And Dan, you're a rock yeah. star. Thank you. Okay. I have a lot of Thanks dark matter you. questions for you at some point. We should yep. schedule another hangout with you because yep. I want to about some other things I've learned. And we'll talk more about the results coming out of this program. It's been Absolutely. So exactly. Absolutely. Yep. We've got a lot more hangout. We've got a lot more to learn from Frontier Field. So, uh, and Carol, Scott, thank you as always for, for helping me and for doing this with me. It's so much fun to have you here. Absolutely. I, I wanted to add also that thank there are a lot of... There are a lot of other people also involved than the relatively few numbers that you've seen here. There are a lot of people doing this right. as well. That's right. There's a good collaboration, and we're gonna we're so. gonna keep trying to we're gonna keep coming back and giving you more of a sense of different aspects of this program as well. So this is our third Frontier Fields hangout. We certainly won't be our last. So you'll learn a lot more about the different parts of it. So guys, hope you like this Hubble hangout. The next one we're having next week. Speaking of ultra deep fields. They've added to it. They've added another wavelength to the ultra deep field, uh, the UV, ultraviolet. So we're going to talk with the people who made that image and discuss more things very, very far away. And when you stare at nothing, what do you see with the Hubble? Answer is quite a bit. It's full of stars. <laughs> all right, folks. So on behalf of Carol Christian and Scott Lowe's, I want to thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up.